name is Melissa Jeter, Librarian Specialist for the Art Tatum African American Resource Center, located in the Kent Branch of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Welcome to the Art Tatum African American Resource Center's Oral History Project, the Adrienne Cole Collection. Dr. Adrienne Cole was a local African American historian and educator who began collecting the stories of noteworthy Toledoans in the African American community. With this oral history project, the Art Tatum African American Resource Center honors her memory and her work. Join me and University of Toledo Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Willie McCather, as Toledo's very own African Americans share the stories of their lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Willie McCather. In this segment, we're pleased to welcome State Representative Edna Brown. Representative Brown, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Representative Brown, I know that you've had a distinguished career as a public servant, first as a city council person and now as a state representative. Um, and I'd like to talk about that in the, during this um, conversation. But first, let's go back and talk a little bit about your earlier years here in Toledo. Um, I know that you, you came to Toledo, Toledo at age 12. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what life was like for you growing up in Toledo? Well, you know, I admit and I'm proud to say I enjoyed life. I had a good life, not a privileged life. But uh, I didn't want for anything, and I guess that uh, from an early age, I had ambitions, uh, not necessarily to go into politics. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, as you said, I uh, came to Toledo at the age of 12. Actually, not many people know it, but I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Okay, okay. Do you know um, why your parents came to Toledo? Well, it, it, it's a... Uh, unusual story. Actually, uh, my maternal grandmother passed away here in Toledo in uh, September of 1952, and my mom and I came to her funeral. Okay. And uh, when it was time for, my, for us to go back home, an aunt persuaded my mom to let me stay here in Toledo with her and attend school here, and that's how I got here. Okay, great. Later years, of course, uh, my mother and, and, and uh, after my dad died in Alabama, uh, my brothers and sisters came to Toledo. Toledo. Okay, good. Okay. So, so at, you came here at 12 then. What schools did you attend here in Toledo? I actually, I started at Robinson Junior High. And uh, if I can, I'll tell you an unusual story uh, about that. I was in the eighth grade. I was a year ahead of my age group. And uh, <clears throat> when my aunt went to enroll me, of course, I had no papers or anything because I had not planned to stay here. Mm -hmm. um, finally, they decided, okay, she could enroll me, but I had to go into the seventh grade. So I went back, which didn't bother me because sure. I knew nobody here, and it was just <laughs> like going to school. Sure. And later in years, I found that that was not unusual for children coming north from the south, that they were put back a grade on the belief that they were behind the children in the north. Not true in my case. So that kind of helped me to excel somewhat uh, in my classes. Okay. Well, let's go back. Do you think that living in the south, do you think that your education was on par with the education that you received in the north? I do. Indeed, I do. Uh, I did not live in a rural area. Of course, uh, Tuscaloosa is, is a city. It was segregated, of course. But I felt that I very much received an education uh, equal to what I received here. Okay, good, good. Let's talk about church a little bit. I know that you are a current member of Brayton um, United Methodist Church. Is that the church that you grew up in? Abs no, it is not. Again, I, there have been many uh, changes in my life. And again, I think some of them... Uh, perhaps was because of ambition, but not church. I started out at um, Mount Nebo Baptist Church. That's where my aunt and that family belonged. They were over on Wabash Street at that time. Okay. Later years as a teenager, I uh, joined Calvary Baptist Church because some of my friends belonged there. Okay. Uh, then later in life, uh, I met my husband and joined uh, Mount Zion, and we were actually married there. Uh, in between, <laughs> I hate to say this, but our oldest daughter, when she started uh, school, mm -hmm. we put her in St. Philip's Lutheran 
Okay. And of course, they expected parents to be active in the church, and it was more convenient to actually become a member of the church. Uh, okay. And I stayed there and probably would still be there today, except somewhere along the way, my husband uh, um, met Reverend Reed from Brayton. And okay. one Sunday, he came home and told me <laughs> I've joined Brayton United <laughs> Methodist Church. And I, for two years, stayed at St. Philip's longer. But eventually, I found that it was better for us to be together. And so I've been at Brayton ever since. Ever since. Yes, okay, good, yes. good. But let me go back. So, so growing up for you, um, was attending church an option, or did you have to go to church as a child? As a child, as a small child, I remember very well my mom, uh, she and dad didn't go too often, but us kids, we had to go to Sunday school on Sunday morning. We lived about two blocks from the church, okay. and uh, we had to go to church on Sunday and participate in the youth activities at the church. Okay, good, good. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about your social life as you were coming of age in Toledo. What kinds of things did you do socially as you were coming of age here? I didn't do a lot of extracurricular activities like mm -hmm. most teenagers mm -hmm. uh, because I worked and for some reason I had a job since I was 14. Uh, um, my uncle had a little grocery store and he found out that I could count very well. And so he'd take me to the store with him on Saturdays and let me work the look candy counter and um, I continued to do that even in the summer and he would pay me fifteen dollars a week Is that right? and so I was able to like you know pay my uh, school expenses and stuff okay. and then later of course I continued so primarily what I did was um, attend the sporting events at school uh, love to go to the YWCA on Friday night uh, canteen and uh, a movie once in a while with friends, but other than that, I, I did not do a lot of uh, uh, extracurricular things. Okay. What are your memories of, of Door Street as you were coming of age? Oh, Door Street. Everyone loves to talk about Door Street. <laughs> uh, I, I can tell you this. My take on Door Street may be somewhat different than some people because I remember two Door Streets. I remember the uh, vibrant, busy, uh, Door Street that had uh, major businesses on it. Uh, and uh, many people like to talk about the Door Street with the black owned businesses, but I remember Door Street uh, before there were a lot of black owned businesses. There were two supermarkets there was a Kroger and AP, two movie theaters, uh, a huge five and ten cent store. Uh, uh, First National had a bank. It was vibrant. Okay. The lower end of Door Street had a few uh, black businesses, but uh, up, oh, I'd say maybe up to maybe City Park. Then later years when Urban Renewal came in, I remember that as businesses and fraternal organizations were uh, moved, or shall we say, the buildings were purchased and uh, dem demolished for urban renewal purposes, then that's when all of those started to move down Door Street. And it was vibrant then too, but they were, I would say, smaller businesses, but very vibrant. Okay, so then not all of the businesses that were on Door Street were all black owned? No. Okay, no. Because that's in something the, in, that. In the early days, I remember vividly, um, starting from about um, Holly Street, Lawrence Avenue, uh, going west. I dare say there were very few black-owned businesses in the earlier days. The earlier days. Okay, good, good. Um, so then, uh, long, in terms of, of you coming of age here, who would you consider, who are some of your closest friends? <clears throat> Again, as I said, I, I did not do a lot of socializing. Mm -hmm. I, I did not purposely do it, but because I was busy, because of the things that I wanted to do. Uh, I always wanted to be a, a person who was a professional, shall we say. Okay. I wanted to wear heels to work. I wanted to wear stockings to work. Uh, I didn't want to be a domestic. I, I, I didn't want any service type jobs. Sure. So I was always doing things like that. After school, I'd go home, you know, I'd, I'd do my homework, I'd go to the library. 
I, I didn't do a lot of things with uh, other people. Okay. Uh, one friend at a time, okay. perhaps, okay. you know. Uh -huh. That's good, okay. Well, let me, let me switch gears a little bit. I know you grew up um, in Toledo at a time when, a time in our history when race relations were not the best in all places. How would you characterize race relations in Toledo um, when you were coming of age here? I would say that uh, discrimination and prejudices were subtle, they were hidden, and of course we, uh, when I was growing up, it, it wasn't actually, uh, I said it wasn't prevalent, mm -hmm. but it was, but we weren't as aware of it, shall we say, as the children nowadays because uh, of desegregation and things that have happened. Sure. Children nowadays are very much aware of it. And uh, I would say, now that I think back on things, uh, yes, there was quite a bit of discrimination and prejudice, but it wasn't open. Uh, it was more covert. Yes, it well, was. Were there restaurants that perhaps you couldn't go to, or you, you knew not to go to? I would imagine there were, but I, did not have a first-hand experience uh, with that myself. Okay, okay. Uh, Representative Brown, I'd like to now shift gears a little bit and talk about your political career. But before doing so, I'd like to ask you about um, Adrienne Cole. Uh, Ms. Cole was, of course, an educator and an historian who spent a great deal of her life documenting black life in Toledo. Um, what do you remember most about Adrienne Cole? Oh, such a vibrant lady. Oh, I tell you. A person, had I known her in my younger days, I'm sure she would have been my number one role model. Uh, I admired her so very, very much. Uh, I knew of her, I knew who she was, I knew the things that she did, but I got to know her up close and personal when I joined Brayton United Methodist Church. And I did know her, respected her greatly, uh, a fine, fine lady. My first knowledge of her, however, was I was employed with the City of Toledo Publicity and Efficiency Commission, and they had a library. And her theses, the book that she wrote Absolutely. about blacks in Toledo, I read it there. We had it in the library. And I, thought, I, I could really kind of relate to much of what she said. Sure. Absolutely, yes. Sure. You know, I never had the, the good fortune of meeting Mrs. Cole, um, but I always wonder what must have been her motivation for writing about black history and for documenting it. Do you have any idea? I don't know for sure. She, she was, oh, I, don't, I can't find the word to describe her. Such a fine, fine lady. And you know, she really, really cared about young people. A sure. tremendous educator she was. And uh, she was very eloquent too, you know. She Absolutely. was she was truly a Indeed. lady. Indeed. I, I did admire her, yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, let's now go back to your political career. I know that you spent six years on city council here in Toledo, and you've now been our state representative for the last nine years. And um, so let me just ask you, at what point in your life did you decide to pursue political a political career? Actually, I didn't decide. Okay. Actually, it was something that just kind of happened. Uh, uh, if I can give you just a wee bit of background. Sure. I had been employed, as I said, with the city of Toledo uh, for some 32 years, and I retired in April of 1992, was very active with the union, and uh, was on the city's, believe it or not, in this time and day, negotiating team. <laughs> I was on the union's negotiating team. We were sitting around talking one day, and someone mentioned the new form of government that had just been voted in, this strong mayor, district council, at large council. Sure. And as we discussed it, someone said, Edna, you can't run for your union office. Why don't you run for city council? And we joked about it. Next thing I know, I'm getting a petition and got it signed. And we thought, well, if you don't get elected, we'll talk to the mayor and have him appoint you to a board or a commission. Well, uh, I was very fortunate and blessed 
that I did. By a very narrow margin, I did uh, get elected to city council, and I found that it was an easy transition from uh, being a city employee, a union official, and an elected official. Is it, is it because you were still representing people and fighting for people's rights? Is that absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's what has kept me going is because I find so much satisfaction in being able to help what I refer to as the less unfortunate people. Sure, sure. Um, in your term um, on city council, your terms rather, what, were, what are some of your proudest accomplishments um, as you were a member of city council? I think perhaps my my pride is my proudest accomplishments is not so much what I did for people, but the satisfaction that I got when I was able to pick up the telephone, call a director, and call him by his name. He knew who I was and be able to get problems solved for them. One of the biggest contributions I believe I made was not so much to the uh, citizens of Toledo, but to other members of city council. Because of my uh, city experience mm. and my knowledge of the city budget and that, I taught many of the elected officials exactly how to read the budget and, and what the different funds were and so on and so forth. And so I think that was a, a tremendous contribution on my part because that helped them to better serve okay. the citizens. Okay. Yes. Sure, sure. Good. Okay, let's sort of fast forward then and talk a little bit about your role as our state representative. In looking at your bio, you serve on a number of committees and subcommittees, the House Finance and Appropriations Committee, you chair of the Human Services Subcommittee, the House Commerce and Labor Committee, and many, many others. You know, what's the process for getting elected or selected to these various committees? Well, the process is uh, you are able at the beginning of each term mm -hmm. to request the committees that you wish to serve on. And of course, uh, it's up to the head of your party, in this case, uh, the Speaker of the House this year, uh, as to whether or not you're appointed to those committees. I, they take into consideration uh, your, your background, your training, your education, uh, the things that they know that you have knowledge of, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where they will uh, put you. Now, the Finance and Appropriations Committee that's a prestigious committee, and so um, uh, your knowledge of various things are taken into consideration, as well as trying to select members from uh, different parts of the state. So I was very, very uh, pleased that uh, I was um, uh, put on the committee again this term and received the uh, chairmanship that I requested. Okay, good. good. Serving on so many committees, and you must have an awful busy day um, do, in, in doing your job? It's busy, but when you're busy, you don't notice the time. And uh, uh, you have to be busy because constituents are calling. And the one thing I do know is when constituents call or write you, you are the last result. I know that I am their last hope of getting something done or getting a problem solved. Mm -hmm. And so I, I work diligently to address the concerns of the people that I serve. And then when I come home, I can I come on the weekend. I can just kind of chill out and uh, uh, relax a little bit. Of course, you are required to go to a lot of meetings and banquets and graduations and all of that. But uh, fortunately, uh, the children are all grown. And of course, uh, my husband passed on uh, about nine years ago. Okay. So I do have the time that I can put in and uh, don't feel as though I'm being put up on. You know, we didn't talk about your children. You mentioned you have four children and is it six grandchildren? Is that yes, correct? I do. Okay. Four daughters. Four daughters. They must keep you awfully, awfully busy. Well, they did when they were they young. They did growing up, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they're all adults now. I'm proud of them. Only one live in Toledo. My youngest, she's still in Toledo, and uh, the two youngest grandchildren happen to be hers. So uh, uh, I enjoy that. Uh, they come by on holidays and visit mom, and uh, the grandchildren just absolutely love to come visit. 
So yes, yes, I do. How do they feel about your success as a polit your role as a politician? Oh, they are just so, so absolutely proud of it. You know, it's, it's kind of different. They, they're used to mom being away because when I was with the union, mm -hmm. I went to a lot of conventions and banquets and things of that nature. But now it's, um, uh, I don't know, they probably put me on the same pedestal <laughs> as uh, Mrs. Obama. You know, <laughs> they really are, my, my whole family as a matter of fact. I'm very, very proud of the fact that uh, I'm in the position that I am in, and they're very, very supportive of me. Well, obviously, you do a good job. You've been reelected s several times, and you're now facing your, your last term. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, what um, what are your plans after you leave the, um, the the public side? Well, you know, I'm not quite ready for a rocking chair. <laughs> uh, the Senate seat for this area will be open the same time that I'm term limited. So I'm, I'm looking at that, uh, not saying absolutely that's the road I'm going to travel, but I'm taking a serious look at uh, perhaps running for that Senate seat, and if not, uh, uh, perhaps coming back to Toledo and serving uh, in local politics. Interesting. Good, good. Well, let me just ask you, this before we start to wrap up, um, what special initiatives are you working on currently? Any, anything you're working on that we can talk about? Well, the big thing for me right now is a bill on teen dating violence. And that came about as the result of a young lady who was murdered by her boyfriend here in Toledo, Shanera Grant. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the bill is named after her. Got it passed in the House last session. The last day that we were meeting, it was to come on the floor of the Senate, something happened. So I'm working very, very hard to get that done, whereby teenagers or their parents or guardians can get a protection order uh, when they are being stalked or, or what have you by their boyfriends or girlfriends. Sure, sure. Um, that's, that's big. That's huge for me. It's a big problem that, that many of us did not know existed until I started to look into it. Um, another uh, bill that that's, um, I'm working on, it's so, somewhat ceremonial. Uh, the Prince Hall Masons want their own license plate. And okay. so I'm, okay. I'm working hard right now to try and get that done for them by August. They'd like it done by August. Okay, great. So I'm working on that. Uh, of course, you know, I introduced a bill uh, previously uh, on HPV, trying to get the young ladies vaccinated uh, 13, junior high school girls. Okay. Um, I've kind of put that on the shelf right now until I get some of this other stuff off of my plate. Okay. But uh, I, I'm going to get back um, to that bill because I think that cervical cancer is something that we cannot ignore and something that we need to try to uh, protect our young people. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Um, let's sort of shift gears here once more. Um, we now have our first African-American president, um, Ob um, Barack Obama. Um, where were you during the election, and do you have any thoughts on that election? Uh, one thing I can tell you, and it has been said over and over again by many, I never dreamed it would happen in my life. And what I was doing on election day was running around from polling place to polling place trying to make sure that literature for Barack Obama was being put in the hands of others. I might add, since we're talking about that, I feel that I personally had something to do <laughs> with uh, the turnout in Toledo and by the big margin that he won here. It was I who introduced the no-fault absentee early voting bill there in the House that was, it was eventually passed. I didn't get credit for it, but okay. uh, uh, I didn't get credit as the sponsor for, of it. But I introduced it first, and then it was um, blended into a huge uh, election reform bill. So I, I, I take some credit for that. And as much as because of the early voting, I believe that uh, that helped tremendously in the state of Ohio. Well, I think that's credit well due, so good job. I did get an <laughs> award for it because I introduced it. The uh, 
uh, uh, Election Officials Association for the State of Ohio and the Secretary of State uh, named me uh, Legislator of the Year Is that right? because I had introduced it and it did become law. It made a difference, I think. Yes, I do. I tell you, this is a time in history that I am so, so glad that I'm alive to see it and was able to travel to D.C. for his inauguration. Well, now, but do you think that because we now have a first African-American president that race relations are now, we, we, that racism is a thing of the past? I don't think it will ever be a thing of the past. I think perhaps people will not be as open with it. I, and, and once this president does the tremendous job that I know he will do, I think that the uh, uh, people as a whole will be more acceptant of people of color. I think that they will say, hmm, they can do the job. I'll vote for them. Serve as an inspiration. Absolutely. Well, well, speaking of that, I mean, you are certainly a role model and an inspiration for, for many people, and I think in particular um, young women. What do you say to young girls, to children, about the importance of pursuing their dreams and staying the course? Pursuing their dream, if they have a dream, I tell them, keep it in front of you. Work hard toward it, but be realistic that if for some reason you do not achieve it, be as close as you can and don't be saddened because in life, I do believe, that our lives have been predestined. Absolutely. And it may not, that may not be the thing that God wants for you, but pursue it anyway. And then when you finally reach that dead end, take a detour and dream, dream, dream. Absolutely, thank you. Representative Brown, I don't have any more questions for you. Is there anything that we have not talked about that we need to go, that we should touch on or should, that, that's worth mentioning? I'd like to say, if I can, to young people of this generation and generations to come, uh, be more sincere about their education. Pursue their education with a vengeance. I, I don't know why, but for some reason or other, uh, the young people nowadays, many of them, uh, seem to not put as much, place as much value on education as they should. Education is the key to each and everything in this world. Nothing top education. With education, in my opinion, all things are possible. Oh, I certainly agree. Oh, having a good education opens many doors. It qualifies you to do a number of different things. Um, so I, I fully agree with that. I can say personally that, you know, uh, w without having gone to school, uh, without having parents encouraging me to go to school, you know, uh, I think that my dreams would have been limited. So I, I think you're absolutely correct. Education opened many doors. Absolutely. Okay, on that then, let that be the last word. And thank you. Well, thank you for coming in. Much appreciated. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you.